ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to greet you all tonight. It's Tuesday in Philadelphia, the city of champions, and the world is as complicated as ever. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I have... It is Wednesday in Philadelphia, You're right? I got that wrong. That's right. Usually we start. We usually do Tuesdays in Philadelphia, but the, the, welcome to the first Geopolitics with Canary on a Wednesday evening here in Philadelphia. Um, the February 2018 edition of Geopolitics with Granary, as a matter of fact, FPRI's monthly discussion of international affairs. I'm Ron Granary, FPRI's director of the Center for the Study of America and the West, your host and moderator of this discussion. All of us at FPRI. Thank you for joining us today, live here at the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia on the 7th of February, 2018, and live and archived on the internet through our YouTube channel. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Since 9-11, uh, and in the aftermath of the Arab Spring in particular, American policymakers and analysts speculated about cultivating a more open public sphere in pursuit of liberal democratic reform in the Arab world. Despite the expenditure of enormous material and rhetorical resources, however, the idea that one could reach a monolithic Arab public through centrally managed media has proven a mirage that never measured up to the hopes or the dollars invested in it. The failure of such grandiose plans, however, does not mean that there has been no progress in the development of Arab media or in the development of liberal reformist voices. Indeed, the collapse of grand centralized dreams is itself a sign of success. The growth of an Arab public sphere has developed through the breakdown of regional media giants and the emergence of national, regional, and local efforts to make and spread the news. Although long-term success is far from guaranteed, the growth of different media sources offers Arab publics a wide range of voices, encouraging them to appreciate the value of pluralism and disagreement, and to associate that with strength and vitality of a society to build the kind of society worthy of free peoples. Nearly four years ago, tonight's guest appeared on this program to discuss early hints of change within Arab media. Even then, Joseph Browdy balanced hopeful analysis of the potential for liberal reform with a careful, realistic assessment of the region's complex political realities. Recognizing that a free media landscape is essential to developing the kind of vibrant public sphere that makes democracy possible, he also noted that one needs to begin where one can, with the partners at hand, some of whom may have their own agendas. Now he returns to us tonight with a new book, analyzing what has happened and considering what may come next in Arab media. In Broadcasting Change, Joseph Browdy takes seriously the oft-quoted adage that politics is downstream from culture, and thus that if one hopes to change the politics of a region, one must begin by changing the culture. That means broadcasters, not just the news media, but entertainment outlets as well, should consider how to reach the public and shape attitudes without expecting immediate political results. In an analysis that begins with a fascinating comparison of Arab media and the examples of uh, anti-mafia activities in Sicily, which we will talk about, and which focuses especially on the two great powers of the Sunni Arab world, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, Browdy discusses how liberal activists have attempted to advance their agenda through a variety of outlets. With his characteristic combination of hope and realism, he concludes, quote, anyone who wants Arab liberals to succeed enjoys an open invitation to lend a hand. A more auspicious time to engage the region may not come again for generations. So what forces are at work in the world of Arab media? What potential do they have to change society and politics? How will the governments of the region react? And what, if anything, should the American public do? These questions, and yours, will guide us in conversation tonight with our guest, Joseph Browdy. Joseph Browdy, senior fellow with FPRI's program on the Middle East, is a scholar and author whose reach appears in print and on air in Arabic and in English. He studied in the departments of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Yale and Near Eastern Studies at Princeton, developed his Arabic to broadcast quality through years of living and working in the Gulf states and North Africa, and added fluency in Farsi to his knowledge of Persian literature as a graduate student at the University of Tehran. 
In addition to broadcasting change, he's also the author of The New Iraq from Basic Books in 2003 and The Honored Dead from Random House in 2011, for which Browdy was embedded for half a year in an investigative unit of the Moroccan Federal Police in Casablanca. Uh, Joseph is not only a uh, seasoned analyst of Arab media, but he is an active participant in Arab print, uh, Arabic language print and broadcast media from Morocco to the Gulf uh, and stretching across the Atlantic. Uh, he is a brilliant analyst of Arab media and a longtime member of the FPRI scholarly family, and it must be noted, the first person ever to be a repeat guest on Geopolitics with Granary. We are delighted to have him with us tonight. Welcome, Joseph Brown. Thank you. It's great to see you. Good to you. see you, too. Sorry. So I want to start with, a, uh, with a, a question that goes back to something that's at the very beginning of the book, and that is the, the circumstances around the conference that you organized in Palermo, Sicily, for Arab uh, journalists and for discussing Arab media. Could you tell the audience a little bit about its connection, both you know, why Palermo, mm -hmm. uh, what did that have to do with this uh, program, and how did it go? Well, Palermo is a place where a group of civic actors in the 1990s pioneered an approach to uh, countering a non-state actor, an armed non-state actor, mm -hmm. in their case, the mafia, which isn't the first analogy you might make to uh, a given uh, trans-state jihadist group, and yet when you think about it, they really have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. A society within a society with its own honor code its own set of rules, its claim to being the authentic representative of the broader culture. Um, and Sicilian neoliberals in the 90s reached the view that in order to challenge the mafia and really ultimately attempt to defeat them, they needed to undermine their claim to authenticity, to undermine uh, support or acquiescence mm -hmm. to their dominance over Sicilian institutions, and they needed to do that by changing the culture surrounding the mafia to something they called a culture of lawfulness. That was their mm -hmm. galvanizing vision. Um, and they worked through schools, they worked through the Catholic Church, uh, and in very large part, they worked through media, mm -hmm. uh, not just pointed news broadcasts, but also through soap operas, comedies, mm -hmm spoofing the mafia and so on. I didn't realize, for example, that they actually made a comedy series about a mafia don. Indeed, in yes, Sicily. they did. And also those rare cases of um, clean judges or prosecutors who would not accept a bribe or bow to pressure and paid with their lives mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, became the subjects of uh, dramatic miniseries remembering them and inspiring others to follow in their footsteps. Mm -hmm. So this was a very unusual, nimble and effective campaign. And a group of people who were looking to see how, those, um, how that precedent could potentially be appropriated in other environments asked me whether I thought that there could potentially be an opening or an interest in this in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Um, I responded that of those three sectors, media, uh, religious authorities, and educational systems, it's the media that is the most fluid mm -hmm. and dynamic. And at that stage, this is now close to, well, it's about a decade ago, uh, um, receptive mm -hmm. to this. And what happened was we, um, we looked for, um, Arabic media professionals in a range of genres mm -hmm. who might be interested in learning more about the Sicilian model because they felt it resonated with them. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know that when I went to Lebanon, people said, hey, we have a mafia here. It's called the Syrian intelligence and security <laughs> apparatus and it's ally Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I went to some countries in the Gulf, they would say that they felt they had a religious mafia that was dominating uh, the public sphere in their society, the culture, uh, what people were allowed to uh, wear and say and think and so on. Uh, and so it was a remarkable gathering where these figures from Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, uh, Jordan, elsewhere, 
um, met their Sicilian counterparts. Interesting. As well as uh, a Hollywood producer and a gifted uh, uh, journalist from the U.S. and another one from, from Rome, mm -hmm. uh, and actually partnered in the development of content uh, that was inspired by Sicilian productions. Were, were any of, when you approached uh, Arab media folks about this conference, was anybody offended by the comparison? That they, they, they didn't like the, that, uh, that they didn't like this idea that the mafia, that handling the mafia offered any example? For uh, I, I found that they loved the comparison. Interesting. They loved the comparison, and also they loved the prospect of spending a week eating pasta and watching Italian movies. That's right. I'm only, I'm only sorry I couldn't have found uh, a way to come to that conference myself. So yeah, no, there were too, way too many takers for this, <laughs> uh, for this event. The question was who was the most sincere and genuine. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we did indeed find that there were some very serious people who had been thinking in general terms along these lines for years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and were craving uh, access and uh, um, inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it might also have been novel <clears throat> to, to be approached about an initiative grounded in Sicily as mm -hmm. opposed to Washington or mm -hmm. London and so on, a place where none of the baggage associated with, um, for example, American foreign policy toward sure. the Middle East would manifest, right? right. The Sicilians right. have a range of other issues. Uh, and also uh, where there is a kind of a cultural commonality, mm -hmm. as is very well known. Of course, Sicily was once uh, occupied. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the vestiges of that period in Sicilian history are still uh, uh, perceptible in the language, mm -hmm. in the dialect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I, I it's, it's a fascinating prospect. I did not... Uh, literally open the book, and it's one of the it's the, one of the first stories in there, and it's a it's a great it's a great opener for the discussion. So I wanted to, to bring that up. Um, so then to the, the general question of the, the the connection between media and liberal reform. Um, media can have enormous power in encouraging liberalization, right? So Americans have a kind of uh, uh, sort of touchingly naive faith in the power of media to uh, to open up societies. We like to think that happens, and it often does. But it can also be a powerful tool. Media can be such a powerful tool in the hands of authoritarians and worse. I think about uh, radio stations in Poland today, for example, that are very uh, that are uh, very, uh, pushing authoritarian lines, or uh, the, this, the worst story of, of RTLM in Rwanda, right? A radio station that actually uses mass media to encourage genocide. Um, and so the question is: Is what? Specific aspects of the structure, ownership, management of Arab media that you describe make you hopeful that liberal reform will be able to, to have a place in this media? Well, first of all, to ground my, what I like to think of as reasoned hope in realism, um, let's put on the table that the way that you open this question is quite apt mm -hmm. uh, because a great many powers including not only states, but certainly mm -hmm. including states, are using media to, um, to block the free exchange of ideas. It's mm -hmm. sort of a paradox because right. the presumption is that the more media, the more freedom. And yet when uh, a channel like um, Al Ahd in Iraq, which is the property of a militia that is a subsidiary of the Iranian Re Revolutionary Guard, mm -hmm. Uh, has a talk show host go on TV and circulate the, show the photograph of a journalist who is the Reuters Baghdad bureau chief, Ned Parker, and say, this man is inciting against the popular mobilization forces. Oh, dear viewers, if any of you has a shred of uh, dignity, you will not allow him to remain in this country another moment. Um, Ned Parker leaves. And that's what he did a few hours later. Um, and fortunately for Ned Parker, he's an American citizen and mm -hmm. he has somewhere to go. But most of the targets of that type of media intimidation are local actors with nowhere to run. And Al Ahed is one of dozens and dozens of channels that um, attempt to tweak the culture, stigmatize um, divergent viewpoints. Um, and Iran is one of the states that is particularly active in employing that, those types of techniques, but it's not the only one. Right. Back to reasoned hope. There you go. Um, the good news is 
that some authoritarian states have, you know, in light of the bitter legacy of the Arab Spring, and all too keen to um, preempt another wave, mm -hmm. uh, recognize that they need to vest the majority population in the survival of the state. And that means enfranchising them to a greater than degree than in the past. And in that context, some liberal egalitarian principles are useful mm -hmm. because you need them to develop your economy, um, arguably. Again, this is an argument that has been made and won in numerous Arab mm -hmm. capitals. Uh, because you need to transcend sectarian division enough at least to block uh, your country from frittering uh, and fracturing along sectarian lines. And so arguments that liberals have been making in the wilderness for a very long time now enjoy uh, support from some states. And those will, liberals who are willing to strike a bargain with autocrats, mm -hmm. whereby they forswear the revolutionary option and pledge to um, advocate for their values gradually and systemically, mm -hmm. uh, will get a seat at the table and a microphone such that some of the most powerful broadcasts in the Arabic language today are now being managed, I will not say controlled, but certainly managed by liberals mm -hmm. who are in an arrangement with some authoritarian states. When you, when you talk to uh, media people in the Arab world, especially people who consider themselves to be liberals with a long-term reforming vision, is there a lot of uh, uh, disagreement about this uh, bargain that they have to strike, uh, say, with, with the government of Saudi Arabia, with the government of Egypt, with the existing uh, media organizations? Because uh, you know, you know, I'm sitting here with you, right? I'm, I, I can accept the gradualist argument that it's better to get your voice in there and hope the long run to have an impact. But is there, how, how do media people deal with the impatience of folks who would like to see more rapid change and who uh, fear that what one person sees as a uh, sensible deal, another person sees as either selling out or you know, uh, allowing yourself to be put on a leash. Right. Um, well, I would say that that debate was raging a bit more robustly um, in 2011 mm -hmm. and 2012 than it is today. Mm -hmm. And the reason is the bitter realities in Libya and in uh, Yemen, and in Syria, yeah. uh, and, and so on. And so when you marry the fear of chaos and the, the, the conviction that chaos brings the region backwards, brings you farther away from the realization of liberal principles, uh, to the difficulty of building an audience without um, joining uh, some establishment, uh, uh, let's just say, platform, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, means that it's, it's a very compelling argument. It's the argument that has won the day among most Arab actors who regard themselves in, as liberals, uh, who are prominent, certainly, mm -hmm. in the region, such that you find former dissidents now holding uh, the megaphone, uh, in a variety of, of, of places mm -hmm. um, there, and it's important to watch them mm -hmm. because sure. we know that they're willing to go to jail for what they believe in. They've done it before. Uh, and they may pull out, which is a, a profound symbol. It's a feather in the cap of the establishment that, um, that uh, wins them over. And it's also a statement about that establishment if and when they depart. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of push and pull. And I guess the longer you work together, the, the harder it would be for either side. Well, I was thinking it would be the harder for either side to pull out in the sense mm -hmm. the government is not going to make a show of firing somebody that they, they, they were so proud of having hired. Right? So this creates a, one, one hopes right, that it, create, it establishes. Yes. That's right. And you know, you're speaking to a larger phenomenon which is relevant <clears throat> to the way that Americans mm -hmm. and many of our European allies have been thinking about media development programs which they support in Arab countries overwhelmingly focused on 
um, the Western journalist model of uh, investigative reporting to uncover government corruption and human rights abuse. Again, the presumption being the fundamental struggle between free journalists and uh, incumbent regimes. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that if you look at the region and spend time with enough media players, um, you will tend to find that some of the most interesting struggles are being waged not between free media and autocracies, but within the unfree organizations. Oh. Uh, and actually, I, I, when I was in Cairo not long ago, I met Akram Shaban, the BBC uh, bureau chief. And he said that, you know, a lot of Egyptians come to me lamenting the fact that so few jobs like mine are available. They don't want to work in state television. And he said that he always tells them, no, do that. Take that job. Uh, even if you have only 20% of the freedom you want, push against the walls to make it 25%. Mm. And when you think about it, what he's saying is willfully participate in the manufacture of government propaganda most of the time mm -hmm. and become an agent of free journalism some of the time, which isn't necessarily um, adequately intriguing for the Committee to Protect Journalists. Right. Yeah, it's, it's and a, yet, how to help people like that mm -hmm. is an important question. Well, this, this uh, makes me think about the, the issue of uh, uh, media and fiction. So in other words, soap operas, as you, uh, the audience may not know, Joseph and I have a common hero. Um, we're both, uh, we both uh, are big fans of Rod Serling and of the Twilight right. Zone, as is, as is Alan Luxenberg, president of FBI in the back of the room there. And, Al, and Rod Serling was famous for being a, uh, a guy who had very clear political opinions on a great many things. But when he, when he had the chance to develop his own television show, The Twilight Zone, uh, he famously said he had political stories he wanted to get across, but he knew that he couldn't get them across directly. He said that opinions that you cannot put in the mouth of a Republican or a Democrat, you can get on TV if you put them in the mouth of a Martian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what I wonder is, is to what extent the uh, Arabic media uh, are using soap operas, fictional stories, uh, uh, dramas, to encourage liberal reform? And is, um, do we have a sense of, of, do they have greater freedom to do that? And is that making more of an, of an impact on media in the Arab world? To a considerable degree. They know and intuit, as, uh, as you know, and Rod Serling so brilliantly explained, that, um, that entertainment can be uh, <clears throat> a, a, a very profound platform for exhortation, for mm -hmm. moral exhortation and uh, for cultural change. That's the, the, the message of Sicily. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the message of a Saudi comedy show like Tash Matash, which had a 17 year run, spoofed uh, mercilessly, at first subtly, uh, clerics and their impositions on the society and managed in a way that has been documented to really nudge the uh, discussion forward at a time when news broadcasts were sleepy, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, dull and devoid of substance. Is Tash Matash, is that take it or leave it? Is that, no, what is the, what is the, the um, title? Yeah, it's, the it's an allusion to a Saudi game. Uh -huh. and I, would, okay. I would say you either get it or you don't. You get it or you don't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. and, and, and so were, the, was the, were these uh, discrete stories about life in Saudi Arabia? or Yes, they uh -huh. were skits. So skits, for example, right. a, um, a clip that I like to show mm -hmm. is uh, a couple of cops uh, answer a call about a robbery in a house. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, four women uh, veiled as mm -hmm. they must be. Mm -hmm. uh, and the police are about to go in and look for the burglar in their house when he says, oh, wait a minute, we forgot to ask, uh, where's your father? And they say, he's traveling, he's not here. Uh, and say, oh, well, then we can't go in. We can't go in without a male escort. Um, and that was the bitter reality, and it's also a surreality. And mm -hmm. putting it out there and making people watch it um, might seem harmless mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to the casual viewer. But in Saudi Arabia at the time, it sparked death threats and changed the conversation in Saudi Arabia overnight. Interesting. And uh, what are the people who created that show doing now? They are on TV. Uh -huh. right. Yes. So, uh, they, uh, Tash ended a few years ago. Uh, Nasser al-Qasabi, who's the, the star of Tash Matash, uh, starred in a, a, um, an ongoing program actually called Selfie, uh, 
Selfie, right. which is a comedy show. It has a, an annual 30-episode uh, run. They spoofed ISIS. They have uh, ridiculed uh, sectarianism and sort of exposed uh, the differences between Sunnis and Shiites in terms of the, the trifling nature uh, or, or what should be seen yeah. as minimal differences in order to show the common humanity uh, in a separated at birth story. Uh, oh, about one person being brought a Sunni, up as a Sunni, Sunni, Sunni and Shiite Shia parents who, whose kids were separated in the, uh, in the hospital when they mm -hmm. were born and they have to be reunited with their proper parents and re-educated uh, to the sect they were born into and all kinds of humorous... Uh, for example, uh, the Shiite father is telling his newly acquired Shiite son to, um, uh, to go to the, the Hassani mosque, the Shiite mosque, to pray and mm -hmm. learn how to pray correctly. And the kid says, you want me to go to that mosque? He says, yes, go to that mosque, but don't blow it up. It, it was a big laugh line in Saudi Arabia. It's... See, and, and who, who knew that right. you could you could mine such uh, such jokes out of that? But you know, I was thinking that the, you know that uh, Jonathan Swift did more to to puncture political differences in uh, in Gulliver's Travels by having the uh, the fight over which side of a boiled egg people eat first, right? So the, the narcissism of small differences. Um, we can get back to religion perhaps another time, maybe not. But, the, um, but I am actually, we, we talk about Saudi Arabia, and I want to I push on that a little bit more because I am curious, right? The news is full these days of the aggressive reform, reformist, in whatever direction the reforms are going, agenda of the crown prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. And um, in what ways uh, have media in Saudi Arabia been swept along or pulled along in what appears to be an effort by this dynamic young leader to, uh, to change Saudi Arabia. We can talk about whether it's in a liberal direction or not, but um, is, in what ways is he using media in, in, and how is Saudi Arabian media reacting to him? Right. So Mohammed bin Salman is in his early 30s. Right. And so he... Which makes I, I just basically described, a child from, a, from my perspective. Well, That's when you're talking about uh, processes that are generational in outlook, mm -hmm. I just mentioned a, a TV show that's now over and had a 17-year run. Mm -hmm. So he's the generation of somebody who, who uh, doesn't even necessarily remember watching uh, in, in, in such great detail the early years of that show, mm -hmm. but grew up in the shadow of that mm -hmm. and dozens of other um, media ventures that were proactively attempting to tweak the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I bring that up because I think that a lot of the discussion about Mohammed bin Salman and the reforms that are going on today are cast in terms of a binary distinction mm -hmm. between top-down and bottom-up. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we had the Arab Spring and that was bottom-up, it didn't work. Here comes Mohammed bin Salman, he's going to try top-down, let's see if that works. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that the, uh, he enjoys latitude to make bold decisions, for example, to strip the religious police of their authority to make arrests, that might not have easily been made uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that has mm -hmm. to do with the, in large part, not mm -hmm. solely, with the informational environment mm -hmm. uh, that has been developed over time. The decision to, that decision about the religious police was preceded by several years of um, relentless activism uh, in Saudi media, in which corruption in the middle religious police was being exposed, uh, abuses, women were given a chance to uh, express their grievances at the religious police. Um, liberal theologians were explaining why perhaps the religious mandate that they claim uh, is not quite as authentic as they want you to believe. So by the time this decision was made, there was a critical mass of uh, couch potatoes who were ready to cheer that decision. So we, shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate the power of couch potatoes. There you go. Uh, and so having uh, to come full circle mm -hmm. here, uh, I think in any time and place, um, it's got to be top down and bottom up. Bottom. It can't be one or the other. Does he appear on media much to, to directly address the people? Does the conference? Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. He appears through uh, interviews mm -hmm. uh, on Saudi television. Uh, his press conferences are televised and a variety of other remarks and appearances and so on. Um, and I think one of his assets 
is that he is uh, a good old boy in, in the Saudi um, context. Uh, he is not someone who was educated overseas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, he talks like someone who is very in touch with uh, young people in the country. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be very important for him to maintain that, uh, that sense of connectivity. Is there, is there a tradition in Saudi Arabia of the king appearing on television or speaking to the people? Yes, there's yes. a tradition of the king appearing on television and on the front page of every of, issue. Of every, every issue. <laughs> as is the case mm -hmm. in traditionally all Arab, and right. I, I would presume most authoritarian mm -hmm. uh, societies. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, one word answer. Yeah. Yes, good, that's right. Sometimes, sometimes questions get, that's the best answer. Um, well, the, so the tension then, I mean, well, you, your two big examples in the book are Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, which traditionally Saudi Arabia and Egypt have represented different poles within the Arab world. Uh, the, sort of this secular uh, pan-Arab nationalism of Egypt, the, the, more tr the traditional monarchy of Saudi Arabia. Um, in both cases, right, we have societies that are very much in ferment. Um, the regime in, in Egypt is different from the regime in Saudi Arabia, but is also struggling with this, the tension between being uh, relatively more authoritarian versus with, a, with an educated public that would like more liberal reform. So how, in what ways is the media landscape in Egypt different from the media landscape in Saudi Arabia? Well, um, perhaps the contrast begins with uh, the question of the essential stories mm -hmm. that are being told. In the Arab world, there are two big stories, one might argue, that establishment media is telling in the eight enduring Arab uh, uh, dynasties, the kingdoms and emirates. It's the story of a king or a prince mm -hmm. who um, is the guardian of a beloved tradition born of centuries, who promises to protect the tradition and provide for his people. Sounds good. In the military republics, uh, mm -hmm. which are all of, the, all of the ones that collapsed uh, and all of the ones, well, I should say all the ones that collapsed in the Arab Spring were republics. Right. Uh, it's a slightly different story. It's a story of a president who uh, pledges not to preserve the tradition, but to break with tradition and defeat a primordial enemy. Now, that's not to say that there's a great cross-pollination in uh, storytelling between the two sure. and, and in the statecraft that accompanies it. However, uh, you can intuit from those two stories that the president has considerably heavier lifting to do. Because mm -hmm. if you are going to radically remake, as opposed to ride the waves of tradition, uh, then you have a lot of indoctrinating to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the machinery of media in Arab republics has always been much heavier machinery. Mm -hmm. uh, and it remains that way uh, in Egypt today. There is, in republics, there are certainly exceptions on both sides, I don't want to overgeneralize, but let's just say that in the monarchies there's greater potential for the decentralization of media. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. There is surveillance and control in mm -hmm. every Arab autocracy, whereas in, uh, in Egypt um, we have seen uh, President Sisi reassert control over the, the very heavy machinery of the Egyptian radio and television union that was built by Gamal Abdel Nasser, mm -hmm. and where the 46,000 employees of that building, that imposing building on the banks of the Nile, still pledge allegiance to Ahmed Said, the uh, ideologue of Na Nasserism, who brought down uh, really? the Iraqi monarchy and so on. It's, I mean, uh, pledge allegiance, I, I say that uh, not literally, but there's a remarkable video of Ahmed Said's birthday party, uh, his 90th birthday, uh, just a couple of years ago, where they brought him in to be feted at uh, the Egyptian Radio and Television Union. Interesting. So Sisi may perhaps not fully have come to grips yet with the, the possibility that you can have religious demagoguery, but you can also have secular demagoguery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the same conspiracy theories mm -hmm. uh, that are being used as a tool of blame deflection have a secular manifestation, not just a religious one. And well, so, well, and I find this very interesting because the idea that a secular regime, because it has to create and regularly recreate the conditions of its founding or the tradition of its tradition, is, um, has to work harder in media than a monarchy that can rely on a great deal of sort of native slash organic 
sympathy among the population. I, I don't know, that's, that, might be too, that might be too generous to monarchies, but in some ways monarchies are not required to be as aggressive in their propaganda as secular regimes can be. Secular regimes who are aware of their, the relative shallowness of their roots. I put on the table that I'm making a, a, a generalization that is vulnerable to a great many objections. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. However, uh, I would say, certainly in the areas where I focus in the book, mm -hmm. and uh, in a great many cases, you find decentralization mm -hmm. and a trend toward decentralization, the phenomenon of the media city, mm -hmm. uh, for example, that you have in the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. where general guidelines, uh, some expressed and some implicit, are imposed on any media company from en anywhere in the world that wants to set up shop uh, in this specially designated area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's no equivalent to Air2, the mm -hmm. Egyptian radio and television union in the UAE. Interesting. Um, I want to, I wanna, this is my warning to the audience, right? I'm going to turn to you for questions in just a minute, so you should begin to uh, develop those questions. I'm going to ask Joseph one more here. And this is, uh, we talk about Arab media, we talk about media in Arabic, right? The, the joke about uh, Anglo-American media cooperation is that the United States and Great Britain are you know, two countries separated by a common language. Um, the Middle East is a region of dozen, uh, dozens of, of, of countries uh, separated by a common language, um, and but how how does the role of uh, what's the, the the interplay between Arabic as a as a language of the entire region and the specific uh, interests and, and media structures in individual Arabic language states? How does that how does that play out in the way that the whole region uh, both produces and consumes media? Well, you've heard the <clears throat> the. Uh, expression that uh, a uh, language is a dialect with an army and a navy. <laughs> and that um, premise is challenged in the Arab world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you have the paradox of things that are called dialects, uh, those that are spoken, for example, in Morocco uh, versus those that are spoken in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. where the, um, the difference mm -hmm. between some certain dialects in those two countries mm -hmm. is as great, if not greater, than the difference between two Romance languages. Mm -hmm. right. um, and there are um, very deeply rooted uh, political and ideological and religious reasons why the recognition of these dialects as languages is problematic. Mm -hmm. But from a practical standpoint, you are actually seeing, for example, in Morocco, uh, there are uh, publications that are now written in Darij al Maghrabiya, which is the Moroccan vernacular, uh, to say nothing of broadcasts, which mm -hmm. are in the vernacular. Um, sometimes when you talk about this phenomenon in Arab country, you may be accused of attempting to divide the region mm -hmm. against itself. Uh, but there is actually a case for recognizing the linguistic diversity in the name of social justice because, and, and national development because what everybody speaks in Morocco is some uh, form of the Moroccan vernacular. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, the ability of ordinary people in uh, Morocco, poor people, to speak modern standard Arabic uh, eloquently to say nothing of people in the villages, mm -hmm. to say nothing of Berber. Right. Even, even their, their vernacular is uh, not so stellar. Uh, um, means that if you engage serious discussions through vernacular, you have the opportunity to engage a much larger number of people mm -hmm. in that discussion. I'll say very briefly, because I know you have other things you want to cover. That's right, but this is good. That, with all that said, satellite television has also had the effect of streamlining language. I was wondering about that. Um, and, um, and so th there is greater connectivity mm -hmm. by way of modern standard Arabic t today uh, than there was when Najib Mahfouz wrote a line in a novel in which he described how some politician was speaking platitudes in modern standard Arabic and people were walking by without a clue as to what he was trying to explain. Interesting. Uh, so it's not quite that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that's an interesting issue about how media can do that. In the same way, right, that the, the Quran itself encouraged the creation of a common Arabic tongue. Uh, it television may be that can do social that too, media right? at the same time takes mm -hmm. things in another direction. Because right. I text with people all over the region and we're texting in dialect. Ah. Uh, we're not texting in fusha. Right. Oh, interesting. Tweeting. And so or on. tweeting. So, well, the, the question of so, do you do you carry multiple phones to be able to tweet in multiple languages, or how do you how do you work your no, keyboard? No, you, you know, on an iPhone, you have multiple keyboards, uh -huh. as Same. many as you want. So, so that works Same. just well. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Yes, right here. How we'll wait for the microphone to come for you. There we go. Yes. How prevalent is um, the satellite TV like Al Jazeera versus the national? Uh, television, yeah. and, and also uh, how impactful is it? Mm -hmm. So, um, the Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, uh, are two, the two most prominent examples of um, nominally private institutions that are wholly dominated by uh, their respective royal families. Uh, they are something different than state media. Um, they are more popular than state media. Although there is now a, a resurgence in interest in state media and the possibility of reforming uh, uh, the government controlled channels as well. Um, nonetheless, what you have in the Arab world is on the whole um, a a, state, a community of state broadcasts, which are uh, not necessarily the most popular, but they command uh, a loyal family, a following among some, some and are not going anywhere. And then a larger number of hybrid ventures that are, in some sense, it may be a public shareholding company. Uh, the people who staff it are practicing aspects of the journalistic profession but are ultimately committed to a narrative um, and the inculcation of a set of sensibilities, which ultimately is the most important thing that they're doing. Uh, I argue in the book that in light of the fact that this is not something that is precisely the same as journalism, but it overlaps with journalism, uh, it's important not to evaluate them on the basis of, the, of any standards they may fail to meet, but on the basis of the work they actually do, which is inculcating values, and to explore the merits of those values, and the extent to which it might be possible to negotiate over those values, uh, and talk about how to expand them. Um, and then the meaning of the news and the use of facts um, may become more constructive. And I think we've seen positive trends and negative trends uh, in that respect. Interesting. Don Carden right here? He's right, he's right here with the microphone. If I remember correctly, you were here about four years ago. Was it during the time that John Stewart had a, one of his uh, correspondents over in Egypt? Was it Egypt? And caused <clears throat> a tremendous revolution over there, really a big problem. Came back and then, oh, would you give us a sequel to that and what has happened since that time? Well, uh, John Stewart, there are several knockoffs of The Daily Show uh, in Arabic. Uh, I, I can think of at least three, but I know there are more. One of them is the one I think you're alluding to, which is Basim Youssef, who started a show in Egypt. Um, then in Iraq, uh, there's something called The Bashir Show, which is uh, in Iraqi dialect. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, and it's all about Iraq and only Iraq. And now even Islamists have Daily Show-like uh, programs. There is a, a, an Islamist-leaning comic named Yusuf Hussein, who's himself Egyptian, probably residing in Qatar right now, who has a, a very popular Daily Show knockoff, uh, in which he is spoofing Sisi, uh, who is, of course, vulnerable to satire in so many ways. Um, so, come back to your question, I guess. Uh, the Daily Show format resonates. It's universal. I'm, I'm going to guess that you'd find it in other parts of the world as well. That the Germans fired too. Not I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, the format itself is value neutral. So you can have any number, any number of ideological uh, 
uh, convictions. Uh, you might be a uh, liberal, as in the case of Basim Yusuf. You might be more of an Islamist, as in the case of uh, Yusuf Hussein. Um, and uh, it speaks to the fact that it's not just about um, technique and professionalization, which is a lot of what Western-backed media development programs do. It's also about the substance and what exactly are you, what are the ideas that you're trying to promote through your humor? Because there are all kinds of ways you can make people laugh. Hmm. It says something about the, uh, the development of the understanding of the audience too, right? That everybody realizes, no matter what their position is, that this is a way to reach the public by trying to be funny. Uh, certainly, you know. certainly. And um, there, the, the nature of humor has evolved and it's possible to do things uh, today that you couldn't a few generations ago. You probably know all about the, um, the way that satire was used in the GDR mm -hmm. uh, to very subtly spoof uh, the establishment uh, before the Vider Vereinigung. Mm -hmm. um, there were things like that in Iraq under Saddam. Really? On the level of uh, village theater, community theater. It was not on television. Mm -hmm. So Saddam didn't see it, so that it was okay. Well, they would do things. I remember a story of one uh, guy leaves his house, um, or I should say walks into his house uh, in this play that happened mm -hmm. in a, uh, a community theater in Baghdad during the Saddam years. And he said, Allah uh, taqam minna ya bush. God avenge, you know, God wreak vengeance upon you, O bush. Uh, and... Uh, the audience knew that it was actually a stand-in for Saddam because the audience knew that that's what people say when they get home after putting on a face in public in Iraq and pretending to praise Saddam and pretending to adore everything he does. And they get, in, get, in, get home and they start uh, in the privacy of their own home saying something else. So there were ways in which these signals, mm -hmm. I mean, Iraqis were brilliant uh, decryptors of comedy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible to, to veil ever more thinly mm -hmm. uh, in satire today and to have things that were once only on the street or in community theater now appear on television. Interesting. A question, um, let's go up here, Sam, and then to Lionel. Uh, specifically in Saudi Arabia, uh, this liberal movement, how tolerant is the king to uh, criticism? And in Egypt, likewise, how uh, tolerant is uh, Sisi, uh, the president, receptive to this criticism? Yeah, I mean, I, along those lines, is, is there a general sense of where the limits are or, or our media uh, but still trying to find out where the limits are. Right? Do they know what they can make fun of and or what they mm. can criticize safely and what is not safe? Sure. Uh, there is no um, in enduring autocracy in the Arab world, right? There's one ongoing democratic experiment in Tunisia. In the rest of the region, it's autocracies, failed states, and failing states. Um, alas, I mean, depending on how you draw the map. Um, so they're really is uh, there are very few places in which you can directly criticize the head of state um, in any sort of a um, uh, you know, frontal way um, and expect to, uh, to do it again tomorrow. Um, <laughs> there is uh, all kinds of criticism that it's possible to make and it's possible to introduce new ideas in nearly every Arab country uh, if you master um, the, the, the nuances of navigating mm -hmm. red lines. Mm -hmm. Of course, the most um, difficult red lines to navigate are the ones that are never drawn, and that's the, the, the censorship that is most um, effective is systems where you're forced to censor yourself where you submit a script and it's either accepted or rejected. You don't get to negotiate over removing two lines. Uh, you have to uh, worry about whether the script will, will, will see the light of day at all. 
Um, nonetheless, uh, to return to the example of Tash Matash, 17 years worth of social criticism, uh, never a direct uh, criticism of the uh, personage of the king, nonetheless, uh, satire and, and a critique of the um, the society over which the king presides, um, shows that there are ways in which um, it is possible to convey criticism systemically. Uh, it's not adequate and it's no replacement for a free society. It's not desirable to inhabit such an environment. Uh, none, nonetheless, um, it's the definition of the challenge to find ways to uh, communicate criticism uh, in a way that enables you to maintain your platform within, within the country. Right up here front, and then that, in that back there. <clears throat> uh, when President Trump made his initial trip to Saudi Arabia, there was a group, I think, of 50 Arab countries that apparently were pledging to combat terrorism to join together, etc. My question is, was that a real initiative? Whatever happened to it? And how was it communicated by, I don't suggest you go through 50 countries, but how was it generally communicated to the citizens of the countries? Um, well, it's widely uh, recognized by Arab leaderships that there is a threat, a domestic threat emanating from a range of jihadist actors uh, in addition to Iran's proxy militias. And so uh, it's quite mainstream to talk about the threat of terrorism and for countries to come together in different ways uh, to challenge it, not only militarily, but also to, to at least begin to talk about challenging it ideologically. Um, <coughs> So there, there are any number of initiatives, and it's not purely a matter of telling Westerners that efforts are being made. There really are uh, serious counterterrorism efforts. The problem is that they'll fall short uh, in many cases in that, um, first, of, one sensitive area is, of course, the nonviolent roots of violent extremism. When you have groups that are um, narrating the, uh, essentially, creating an edifice of ideas that are like a greenhouse of, of extremist sentiment for which uh, an armed actor can come along and say a few words that will urge you to simply take what you grew up hearing to its logical political conclusion uh, and take up arms. Um, and so the, the, there is a much larger uh, edifice of nonviolent extremism, which has not only a religious variety but also a secular variety uh, that is yet to be dismantled. Um, there are some countries that have come for farther along than others uh, in doing it, but there's, there's a great deal of work that needs to be done. In the back of the room here. <clears throat> I'm just fascinated by these shows that are, you know, tickling the viewer to think about things in a different way. And it, it went for 17 years. It must have had some popularity to it. Mm -hmm. um, is there fear in those um, directors and producers that they gain power and that that serves in a threatening way for the standing government? Well, in the example of Tash Matash, this is a, a troop of people who, in good times and in bad, have thrown their lot in with the monarchy in the sense of um, being unwilling to accept the monarchy as a monolithic alliance with clerics, um, but rather uh, they wanted to appeal to the monarchy to recognize the, the dangers of relying on clerics uh, in, to manage the, the popular culture and challenge uh, the clerics' um, uh, thickness uh, with elements of the royal family. Uh, but at every turn, they were uh, keen to manifest their Saudi nationalism. Uh, and I know these people. They are, they are indeed uh, establishment figures who are 
they believe in a liberal Saudi nationalism, an inclusive Saudi nationalism. And that is part of how you get a run of, uh, of 17 years. These are not um, dissidents against uh, the monarchy, but they are defining themselves in opposition to what they would call a religious mafia, uh, to a non-state actor, uh, which they see as their enemy. Now, somebody looking outside, from outside might say, oh, wait a minute, isn't the establishment somehow manipulating this whole thing like puppeteers or something along those lines? Um, that would have been a debate that, you, that they would have had uh, for a very long time, but I would say that uh, this gradual approach is, in their eyes, validated by some of the reforms that we're seeing in Saudi Arabia now. Mm -hmm things that would really, there's a reason that they might, that they weren't happening 10 years ago and there's a reason they're happening now. And so you conclude the book by saying it's the work of generations, we should, uh, and so everything is uh, step by step, brick by brick, um, but interesting progress in the Arab world. I'm, I'm afraid we are just about at the end of this conversation. Um, I want to remind everyone that the book is Broadcasting Change, that it is available for purchase on your way out if you are interested tonight. Um, I want to thank Joseph Browdy for joining us tonight for this discussion. Um, <clears throat> I also want to, I want to thank the National Liberty Museum for hosting us tonight, as well as BNY Mellon Wealth Management, the sponsor of Geopolitics with Granary. Remember, today's conversation had to come to an end, but today's conversation uh, is just the beginning. The world goes on, whether it's on Tuesday or on Wednesday. Um, and, uh, and we will be here to discuss it on Geopolitics with Granary. If you've enjoyed our discussion tonight, I encourage you to uh, tell a friend and bring a friend next time. To keep up with future episodes of Geopolitics with Granary and other events at FPRI, please visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our iTunes and YouTube channels. You can follow the host of this program. I am on Twitter at Ronald Granary. Until next time, for all of us at FPRI, especially my colleagues in producing this broadcast, Eli Gilman, Natalia Kopitnik, and Rachel Hemmler, and Tom Shattuck, I'm Ron Granary. Thank you for joining us. Good night.